But why don't we start with just some real basic, like, kind of level setting definitions? What, in your opinions, would you consider to be the actual goal of an AI in specifically a strategy title? What, what is it trying to achieve, really, here? I think that in strategy titles, it is basically just a robot that is trying to play the game kind of well and lose really in fun and interesting ways. Um, it is actually kind of crucial when you're building AI, in my opinion, to not necessarily make it be the thing that can conquer everything, but moreover, make it be fun and interactive. Um, I think that, you know, if you have a game of 12, 20, however many um, players in it, and 19 of them are AI, a player's not going to have a lot of fun if they win one out of 20 times. So making it fun making it able to very clearly telegraph what it's doing and lose in fun ways and make the player feel smart and accomplished. I agree with that mostly. I think I think the the only modification that I would make is like, is like some people do want an AI that can like take them into a back alley and savage them. Like that's what like some people want that <laughs> challenge. And I think that we we want that option. At least. Sure. Like, I think that your AI needs to be capable enough to put up a, like, horrifying challenge eventually. <laughs> um, that's maybe my personal leaning, um, because, you know, I feel like once, if somebody is sitting with your game for hundreds or thousands of hours, they're going to master sure. it and they're going to get bored. And if there's a button that they can switch that, like, the hurt me plenty option, and I don't even know what that is. We are learning a lot about this. learning a lot about that. I don't like all of the implications <laughs> that are being made. But what I do like is when AI are competent. And competence is something that you, you can fake for a while, but I think usually it breaks down and then people are like, oh, why does the AI do this? That's stupid. And so I think, I think we could stand more focus on the difficulty of AI and the competence of AI. At the same time, I agree that the AI's primary purpose is a vehicle for game feel and narrative. But that is the point. It's, it's like the, it is the thing that makes the game live and breathe, usually. So neither you really said this specifically. So when you're saying provide a challenge, be fun to play against, lose interesting ways, is it actually trying to win the game? Not, like, yes, <laughs> but, like, not as hard as it could. Like, at least usually. Like, I think that the AI is usually trying to be an interesting opponent or a flavorful opponent. And you're trying to, it's maybe also trying to be a teacher, often. Like, it's trying to say, I'm going to do this, and I'm going to give you the breathing room that you need to learn how to react to me. I'm not just going to, you know, pummel you into the floor yet, although I still contend that it should eventually. Um, but, yeah, I, you know, an AI is a, is a vehicle for communication, just like the rest of the game is. But the AI is, the primary goal of the AI is to communicate whatever the designer wanted the, the player to be feeling at that moment, be that victory or some sort of revelatory moment about a game system or brushing defeat. I feel like the AI, for the most part, drives player interaction with the world. Um, and I don't think it needs to be trying to win. I mean, hmm. even just most games in general, the AI is not trying that hard to win. It's trying to maybe be a bit of a threat at most, but a lot of different decisions uh, are usually made with the, yeah, it won't necessarily make it the most impossible to defeat a robot in the world, yeah. but it makes it more fun to play against. Because yeah. I also think that an AI that follows the, like, whatever the designers have determined is the golden path to victory isn't necessarily the most fun thing to play against, because yeah. then it's just the do X, Y, and Z, and you beat the game. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, and I think that, you know, if you if you read around, like, looking at looking at other people in our genre that are that are designing AI like if you go read like the Crusader King dev diaries on how they they make their AI they're like oh you know we didn't want it to win we didn't want it to win everybody's saying this because it's and, and in a sense it's sort of obvious like like the AI needs to act like a person and people are trying to win but not in like the usual sterile mathematical sense they're they? they're playing to get well I, I just click around I send units to random parts of the map right I just like to watch them move that's that's my I'm pretty colors and flashing lights, but like you know, so I'm sure other players do want to win. But like if I was if, when I was younger and I was playing the Civilization games, I was like, ah oh, man, in a toga, very large, and that was like my experience as a child playing a game, right? And so I think it's you know, I think a lot of people aren't playing the game to win. And if you face off against an opponent 
Like, I had a friend that would always play games just specifically to antagonize me. So he would name all of his units Will Sucks and things like that. That's fair. Yeah, and that's, you know, a valid strategy. I don't know that that's something you can generally apply to AI, but it, the point is, like, if people do weird shit, and AI should also do things that are not just, you know, on the golden path, as you say. I agree. Yeah, I think that's actually something to kind of highlight, especially when talking about strategy games. And I'm not saying it's only related to strategy games, but... Players in this genre space often aren't playing for that, I just want to win, get highest score, pummel the opponents, and walk away feeling like a victor. Many times they're playing for an escapist fantasy reason, a power fantasy, or just to enact a story for some kind of narrative thing that they're building in their head, like, say, like in a Crusader Kings game. Are you trying to win when you play that? What is win? How do yeah, you define win? Right. Defend, yeah. it's, it, no, you're building a story. You're telling an emergent story about your life as a leader making strategic decisions. Mm -hmm, right. um, if you yeah. played Crusader Kings rationally, you would never go and take on 20 different lovers. You would never try to make the Pope a cannibal. All of the things that make Crusader King what it is, which is spectacular. Yeah. I mean, and I was, I was looking at a, uh, is it called Old World? I think it's called it's not yeah, New World, because that's the MMO. Yeah, Old World. I was reading a review about Old World, and the thing that they loved is, like, they were like, oh, my good friend Confucius went and did this, and it was crazy, but then I made a horrible mistake mm -hmm. and got him killed. It's like, that experience, I think one of the things that's cool about, you know, the, the 4 egg genre is that it's sort of traditionally taken in historical characters, and you know something about them, so you have this personal connection, so there's even more of a temptation to make a story out of that. And yeah, and that's cool, and that's why... Well, my broader whole shtick about AI is that it should be able to handle anything that the player does in a way that is satisfying. And I think that at least in my brief searches around, and to be fair, I don't know that that's possible, well, just like from a computational perspective in general, but I've never played a game that hasn't disappointed me on some level in the AI department in particular, and that's why I do what I do, because I want to make that game. Right. But. <laughs> but there's also a unique challenge with strategy games, which is that they are usually massive. They have yeah. 400, 600, 1,000 pieces of individual game data, wherein even robots playing chess are suddenly like, you would have to have all the computers in the universe, and even still I wouldn't be able to go and figure out what happens after move eight. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. And, and like, yeah. And that is, I think, probably the fundamental limitation. That's why... Uh, you know, game AI cheats like mad because it has to, because it can't actually solve the problem that you would like it to. Um, but I, I think that our goal should always be to make an AI that plays like a player does, except you can control exactly what that player is thinking and doing at every second, down to the minutiae of what designs the heart desires, ideally. So you said a fun word there. You said cheat. I did say cheat. You said cheat. So... This is kind of a contentious topic if you talk to a lot of players, a lot of devs. Is it ever acceptable, wanted, desired for the AI to cheat the player? And what does that even mean to cheat? I think my personal gut feeling is no, but I am like a stick in the mud on this topic. I think that it's fun to have different game modes where you're like, the AI has 15 alpacas more than you do at all times. Like every time you get an alpaca, they get 15 and live with that. That's like an interesting new state you've put the game in. But other cheating, like Empire Earth cheating, is like not as, not as fun to me. Like Empire Earth was dealing with super constrained resources, and so the way that they handled AI was there is a counter to every unit. The AI knows all of the units that you have, and it will spawn those units off screen and kill you with them. And that's fine, except like there are there are instances where the where it feels really unfair i think and i think in any game that you, that you choose where cheating occurs players when they notice it are very unhappy about it mm -hmm. that's been my that my perception anyway should we perhaps make a distinction between blatant cheating like as in rule breaking information breaking versus something like handicapping yes I, and I think, I think handicapping is like a choice that the player can opt into. It's clearly communicated. You're not hiding it behind the subterfuge because it's immersion breaking. You're saying, this is just the situation. And if you're in a historical game, you'd be like, hey, you're invading France. They've lived here for a while, so they have extra stuff. And you're just going to have to deal with that as the invader. That is your challenge. I think that's very interesting. But ideally, your AI shouldn't have to cheat to get done what it's trying to do. It, not cheap in the poopy way, cheap in the fun way. I, yeah, I mean, generally speaking, I am pro-AI cheating. I know, very controversial. Disgusting. Um, 
He's joking you. But the fact of the matter is, that is the case in a lot of strategy games. Like in 4X games, AIs are moving stuff in the fog of war that they shouldn't be able to do. Yeah. Right. That is always happening. And I don't necessarily think it's the worst thing in the world. And there's always going to be that person that, you know, surrounds the perfect little plot of fog of war and is like, I knew you were cheating. Yeah, exactly. And go and figure out exactly how they're cheating, for instance. Um, and that, that's always going to be the case, sure. Um, but to some degree, it is sometimes just not possible to make an AI that is that hardcore for the people who want the hardest of hardest experiences. The, we're going to have to make this cheat to go and keep up with you. And as long as it is an opt-in and not a, we're just cheating all the time, yeah. I think that's more reasonable. I just think in every case that I can think of, it's not an opt-in, it's always happening. And that's why, like, you know, people that have played 4X games for a long time know that the AI is omniscient, for instance. True. Know that it can see all of your units and will, like, build dummy units and just put them in a corner because it knows it's going to react to them and then exploit that. And, like, that's fun in its own way. What I've story about that. <laughs> there is someone... In her office, Dan Baker has also spoken at stage before, who uh, figured out that was what basically the Sephora was doing. And so he built a big tanky unit, fortified it on a hill in a forest next to the enemy's borders. And he's like, watch them flock like ants. <laughs> but they couldn't take it down, so he would then march in behind them and just kill everything. Yeah, I mean, and, and Dan frightens me. But that's the... <laughs> The, like, it's just too powerful. That's a lot of thinking ahead that I would never do. But like, I, I appreciate that that is still fun. That's still gameplay. And if you, if your, if your engineering team and your design team are passionate enough to massage the cheating such that it feels good, then you know you can find yourself in like I don't know whatever some some good relationship between the player and the game, like an open relationship sort of cheating situation instead of like a like a subterfuge lying relationship sort of situation is my current. So polyamorous AI is where we landed. Polyamorous AI is what I'm into. Right. There we as go. long as it's communicated, it's all above ball. board. Okay. Right. Right. There we go. <laughs> it's what I'm after. So perhaps that was one of the methods you could use, but what are some other ways maybe that you can create an AI that it can feed into basically the player feeling clever and smart when they notice like what the AI is trying to be like, aha, see what you're doing and I can stop you. So when I was seven years old, and I was in, yeah, I know, right? And I was in rec basketball. The thing that my dad was desperately trying to get the small gaggle of seven-year-old girls to understand was that you can't telegraph your passes, right? Because what we would do, because we were seven, is we would have the ball, and we would look at somebody, and then we'd be like, almost basically just say out loud, I'm going to pass to this person. We'd then step towards them, turn to face them, and then with all the leisure in the world, pass the ball, and then somebody would, in the meantime, just take the ball during the pass. Of course. He was a very patient man. <laughs> um, I think fundamentally, AI has to do that, has to telegraph their passes, has to say, has to look at something and say, I am passing the ball here, and then very slowly, so that way the player, when they intercept, goes like, I'm so smart, I saw it coming, and I totally planned for it. Um, so they need to do the opposite of little seven-year-old rec basketball players and be very explicit with what they're trying to do. Yeah, and I think part of that just comes down to good game design independent of AI. Like, for instance, sure. you know, if you have a multiplayer game, it should, there, there should be a way that you can learn to read what your opponent is doing such that you can counter them. And sure. I think that's very important. And I think especially lower difficulty AIs should, like, I don't know, send scouts ahead of their army so you can be like, hmm, Maybe being seen is a bad thing. Um, and yeah, so AI is a teaching tool, absolutely. Um, but I feel like the other thing that you need to create those sorts of moments is really fine-grained control over your AI. From like a designer's perspective, how do you actually make those moments happen? How do you, like from concept to where they should be telegraphing their moves, how do you actually get them to do it is something that needs to be designed into the AI from the get-go. Is is very finely controllable behaviors. And if you have that, then you can make all of those sorts of moments happen. And I think that, at least from an engineering perspective, from a design, from like an actual software system design perspective, that's really essential. And I think it's overlooked often. I think that a lot of, you know, sort of more traditional AI systems, like they are solving a problem that's extremely complicated. Um, and because they're solving a problem that's extremely complicated, customizability is sometimes just not even an option. So I think... Yeah, I think that's an important goal of an AI is, is you can 
you can make it telegraph its moves. Did you say Arjun, or is he? I was going to say, did Andrew have a question? I, couldn't I think it was just feedback. No, okay, okay, cool. Um, you said traditional AI methods. Mm -hmm. Are there different ways, like kind of, um, what are the main ways, like safer strategies, that you've seen AI be created? Do you have like pros and cons and favorites? Oh, you're validating all of my degrees. That's good. <laughs> um, doesn't happen often. Uh, yes. So uh, there, are, there are lots of different ways to do it. Um, I think it, one, of, one of the things that I actually find frustrating about, if you, especially if you go out in, into the wild and try to research game design, is you're like, how do I make an AI? And someone's just like, A star, and they like slap their <laughs> keyboard and call you a virgin. And like, like, it's just not, like, that's good, I guess. You're right. <laughs> like, what is AI if not a series of if statements? Yeah, exactly. Um, and, I, you know, so there, there are a couple of things to... I use a to, switch case. Yeah, hot damn it. <laughs> there are a couple of things to, to get in perspective. And it's like, first off, the number of cases that occur on turn five of a civilization game exceeds, like, the possible number of branches that you would hand code into the entire rest of your program. Maybe not turn five, but by turn 50, that's fair. absolutely. Um, so the reality is you actually just can't do that. You actually literally cannot write a if statement, a chain of if statements to actually do it. You technically can. Yeah, um, please no one challenge except You just put in loops. Do. You put in loops and ifs and elses and you make yourself a little state machine and you make yourself a little A star and whatever. But like as we were discussing before, you know, a chess AI has the benefit of there being like something like maybe 52 valid verbs a turn at worst case. Maybe it's 30 or... 13 or... Anyway, it's some number where if you raise it to an exponent, it doesn't exhaust all the memory on your computer before, like, now. 10 turns. Now. Yeah. Now. Um, uh, games in our genre are not like that. Games in our genre is like, good luck simulating one turn. And the problem with... It, the reason for that is you could do more than one thing per turn. So the number of options is the combinatorial combination of all of the units that you have and all of the states you can put them in times time to the time to the time to the time every single time you take a turn. You just can't do it. So even if you wanted to use A star, A star is, uh, by the way, a method where you can search through these very, very large combination spaces efficiently by using some kind of mathematical function that tells you which direction to go. If you're pathfinding, I will contend the one instance where A star is the correct, unequivocally <laughs> correct option, you can use a heuristic that is how far am I from this point in like X, in like whatever, linear distance, Euclidean distance, and then you can choose your path that way. But if you're in a more complex space, like a, I would call the, the spaces that we operate in like absurdly complex, that doesn't help you that much anymore. What do you put into your heuristic function? What, do you, what, are, what are your parameters, oh, genius on Stack Overflow? Like, what are you doing? And why? And how? And how does this let design... How do you communicate that to the design team? Yeah. Blah, blah. Like, your heuristic function has 500 parameters in it. Okay, congratulations, you've made a neural net. Like, you can't, you can't do that. It's just not a reality. So, I think... So, what do? What do? Good question. Boy, I'm glad you asked. <laughs> um, I don't know. I mean... <laughs> I don't know, you heard it here. I mean, the fact of the matter is that there's a bunch of different ways that you can approach AI. I mean, my personal yeah. favorite is trait-based AI, which is you basically <laughs> give the AI a, a personality... Which is this guy is pretty rude, um, but slovenly. Yeah, he's slovenly, but he cares a lot about religion, um, and he doesn't care a lot about how happy his people are. Go off into the world, right? And so you can give the AI, all right, cares about these three things. Go on from there. So it's like the well, I don't know a lot, but I apparently care about religion. Okay, well, time to start building religion stuff, I guess. Yeah. Um, this helps in terms of the sort of telegraphing your past so that if you, in Civ five, uh, meet the Aztecs within the first five turns, you're like, ah, well, time to start making military units, I suppose, um, in that you start to get these sort of personalities from them. Mm -hmm. Um, and that's my, in my mind, a very valuable way for them to navigate through a game is that you can go and look at and see, oh, how does this guy behave? Oh, okay, I have a vague idea of what he's going to do, yeah. even if it's not perfectly um, drawn out for me. Yeah, and like that is that is I think this, that every like every game studio that has released a successful forex has done maybe not trait based in particular, but they have constructed an AI that has a certain set of values that are understandable to the designers, and they tweak those values based on who they are and what they're doing. 
and they moment by moment based on basically what has happened right now and maybe you know a chain of saved events from the past make decisions about what they're going to do next my objection to that particular stance although it does work for most of the goals is that there is no ability for it to plan ahead still maybe it can look ahead a turn maybe but that puts you in the situation where you end up in, in like, you know, a lot of Forex games where the enemy AI may be very good, but they struggle to do things that require long-term planning ahead, like taking over a city, for instance. And it Takes makes them forever. seem very irrational half the time. And you can end up in hysteresis events where they change their mind a lot because they end up in just these weird edge cases that you didn't think about. And the only way to actually get around that is to give your, ability, your AI the ability to plan ahead, which is what I like to do if I'm designing an AI. And... I think that the reason that people don't do it is because they see the combinatorial nature of the problem. They're like, oh, it's just impossible. But it's not impossible if you let your AI think in the abstract, and then you have these abstract goals that you project forward based on much less information, and then you allow your AI to traverse, to basically, in a sequence, address those higher level goals using the sort of traits that you would do. And that gives you the best of both worlds, where not only do you have an AI that makes sense moment to moment, but it makes sense long term as well. So there's your answer. <laughs> That's how I would do it. That's how you would do it? <laughs> yeah. Excellent. Um, so that'll make sense. But in that kind of more goal-focused, trait-based planning ahead, how does difficulty settings fit in? Yeah. I mean, I love the FTL strategy for difficulty which is just everything is the exact same except you get slightly less of the in-game currency um, when you beat an enemy ship. And it's a huge difference. So every time. Just, just very small number constants, making your economy a little bit harder to maintain instead of having these giant overarching changes. For the most part, I'm a fan of doing one small thing and seeing how that plays out and then just scaling it to the extreme. My unqualified opinion that is that, like, you're, you know, you design video games for a living, so you might actually know what you're talking about. I don't. But my opinion no, you is... you write our AI, now I'm Yeah, I know. This. <laughs> yeah. I don't know how to make the systems go, and I don't know how to make a fun video game, right? That's why we have two people for it. Um, the, the, my, my preference is to have, like, completely different personality sets for AI. Like, if I were doing it, I would have... Easy, medium, and hard smartness levels, where the AI like doesn't look at I don't know, doesn't scout very well if they're easy. Does does things that real bad players don't do, and then as you rank up the difficulty, they get harder and harder. Maybe maybe medium AI scout pretty well, but they don't really look at what you're doing and make a plan for it. Maybe really hard AI like Captain America versus Iron Man, you and like anticipate your moves and punch you in the face. <laughs> That's what I think really interesting difficulty scaling could be. That said. That's not, like, transparent to the player at all. And, like, you could co try to communicate it in a menu that's like, by the way, you can't beat this one kind of stuff. You could do that. But I think that, generally speaking, like, in conversations with you, I've been swayed to feel more like, eh, maybe number scaling is better. Like, it's gamey. But, like, and, like, the thing that I always want is, like, ah, but I, what would it actually be like to go to war with Gandhi or whoever? And I, I want that to be communicated in any difficulty levels is sort of immersion breaking at my like gut reaction to it. But at, at, the, at the end of the day, you have to make a fun, engaging video game and having it be confusing because you up to the difficulty level. And now it's like acting completely differently sure. is maybe not the best in terms of clarity. So you mentioned like having it be able to basically do a thing or not be able to do a thing and kind of like a tiered thing. Mm. What about actively choosing a bad outcome, like making a mistake? Yeah. I mean, I think that AI that are omniscient, that are cheating, do that all the time. They intentionally, they're like, Oh, I like left my unit out here, even though I knew you were going to be able to see it. Um, I, there's, I, you know, there's a place for that. I, I feel like, especially when you're learning, teaching opponents, what kinds of mistakes they might expect to see, let them learn how you're supposed to exploit the game, it probably makes sense. And again, that, that's why control in AI is so important. You want to be able to teach those moments to the players, especially on easier difficulties, I would think. Yeah. I mean, I just love making dumb robot children. That's my life's passion, is genuinely making robot children that are so dumb, and that are so clear with what they're trying to do, and then they're so bad at it. That is genuinely where I get joy from it in a lot of ways. Is there, like, does this say something about you that all of your creations must not be... Psycho <laughs> let's not psycho-insulating. Let's not unpack that. All right. Yeah, that's the whole suitcase away. Fair enough. 
Let's do that. So she's swaying you about like not having different uh, kind of like modes of play for AI. Maybe numbers are better. Mm-hmm. But there's been a lot of like at least talk of not a whole lot of work, but it's it's there certainly in some games about AI being modeled off of actual players yeah. in the wild. Like say, oh, there's this popular streamer. We're going to analyze his or hers uh, play style or collect it via telemetry and then like deep analyze it. What are your feels about this approach? I don't like it. I don't like it either. May you elaborate? For me, it's the... There are certain things I do as a player that I would be genuinely so upset if an AI did to me. (laughs) I realize this is bullying robot children, but I to do so. For instance, in CK3, if you technically can't kill somebody because then, oh, you'll get, like, the, uh, you killed your own son, how could you, oh, whatever. I've seen you play CK3, it's horrifying. (laughs) Yeah, it is horrifying, but if you put them in the dungeon and then torture them enough times, they get enough critical health penalties, it doesn't matter, they die, but you don't get attributed with the death, and it's fine. You have to take on a lot of, uh, reputation hits from, like, all your other family, it's fine, as long as you have enough dread to counteract it. I would be so upset if an AI did that to me. I would be so upset if an AI and FTL uh, figured out how to deal with my borders by locking them out of everywhere and then opening the doors to outer space and watching them slowly suffocate. I would be genuinely so unhappy about that. Um, Or if they figured out to... Actually, that's not fair. I do kind of wish they fired their guns a little bit more efficiently. But uh, for me, I would... I think that it's almost devastating a little bit to have the AI pull off a maneuver that's just so good, but also so deep and so upsetting in that way of the, hey, guess what? You're dead. There is nothing you can do about it. There are no (laughs) side effects. You do not pass go to not collect $200. And so that is, I guess, my fear in terms of um, just taking how a player plays and making that AI, is that there are certain things that a player does that an AI should never, ever do. Yeah, I think the thing that troubles me about that is that there's this like growing effort that you hear, since automation has gotten good, mm-hmm. you can actually make, like, one of, broadly speaking, when we're talking about making a thing that has traits, that acts in a certain way, under certain conditions, we're talking about making an autonomous agent, which we now have very powerful deep learning methods to do through reinforcement learning and whatnot, you could absolutely train an AI to play exactly like a player. Um, And if you have enough data, it'll be really, really good at it. And that could be fine. And that's like maybe, maybe interesting, but only to my view from like a marketing perspective where you can be like, play against Ninja, kids. Like that's, I'm actually not a Fortnite hater. That game's fun. But I I think that the, uh, it, it, that, that, sort of smells to me like how do we remove art from video games like how do we just automate the process of making good gameplay and that's like i guess frustrating to me like conceptually but practically speaking i think there are cases where it sort of makes sense like in my head you know the the league of legends is a good game for getting really sad because people are mean, right? And so if you could somehow capture all of, the, all of the complexity that other players do, but not make them so good that you can't beat them, like you don't want like the Tesla Dota 2 AI that can literally just wipe the floor with anyone. You want something that is somewhere in between, something like a player that makes mistakes, but it's interesting and whatever. Um, it would be cool if we could communicate that level of difficulty. I just think that you probably can't like it you it would be very very hard to curate exactly the kinds of player behaviors that you want without just doing it explicitly and so i think watching the meta develop and like letting your designers who make experiences for a living think about what that meta means and if it's interesting to play against i think there's room for that and certainly having your ai customizable enough that once you've launched you can hot fix it with like hey now it does like this strategy that players really like because it's cool um so I feel like there's some value to taking strategies that players use. I just wouldn't do it in like a raw data-driven way. That feels slimy to me. I'll also say, I'm remembering now, uh, there was, you know, the little AI uploaded to Twitter that was made racist by the internet in like 40 minutes. Mm. Yeah. That's the other issue with player feedback. Yeah. Always the issue with player feedback. Yeah, the quality um, of is really important. Sometimes the internet doesn't do great things. <laughs> sometimes. 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 Um, which is an issue, which is also something to go and consider. 
Yeah, that's true. I mean, I, I think that in, it's harder to do in games. If you're gathering game to limit your sure. data, you're not like looking at chat logs. Like, I would really hate it if an AI beat me and then told me to uninstall, for instance. <laughs> um, but like, you know, it, I would love that. Oh god! But like, like in League of Legends, like, uh, like uh, Chowball Snowgath from like the early League of Legends days, you could get a stacking item and play a stacking hero and just do stupid crap. Like, if you play that hero and you never die, you become god. But if you ever die, you lose and your team hates you. And, like, playing against that in an AI match could be interesting. I don't know. It's, like, a fun, fun strategy. And so coding, having a way to code that in, I think, is important. But doing it, it like, I don't think that modern AI techniques, like, fully data-driven reinforcement learning or fully data-driven deep learning to try to come up with a way that plays a game like a person would and with some sort of neural model is a good idea at this point. There's just not enough nuance to it. It seems like it kind of goes back into what you were talking about earlier, that you don't actually want it to try to win in most cases. Yeah, and you don't even... I, yeah, well... Yeah. Yeah, like, if you if you train a model to just be good at a video game, it's going to be so annoying to play against. It's going to do all the shit that you wish it didn't. Um, but, yeah, I, I can see where people are coming from. They're like, oh, we could use player data, because that does potentially give you a nice middle ground, a very intelligent but not impossible to beat. It's just that you can't then, like... It'd be hard to go in and snip out the parts of that that you don't yeah. like. Um, so we kind of been talking about telemetry and player data. Are there any potential ethical quandaries also about like data farming people's actions or what they're doing and then using them without their knowledge? Everything Maybe. about telemetry is a lot of times an ethical issue of how much do you collect um, the amount of data that you collect on people in video games and from any software is horrifying. True. Um, and I think that those are always going to be concerns. I agree. I mean, like, it, there's there's all sorts of ethical considerations. Like, if you're training, if you're doing, like, if you're curating a new data set for machine learning, you have to be very careful about how you anonymize your data and how you decorrelate things. So you're making sure that people who are maliciously farming this data can't string things together and identify people, for instance. I would say that in a game, though, one of the nice things about our industry is that no one dies, really. And as long as you're not creepy about the way that you set up your, like, game nope. account system, I feel like it's actually kind of hard to get identifiable data out of it. Okay, game. expand upon what you mean by no one dies. No human people. Okay, so I, I, what I'm saying oh, is really? that... <laughs> well, okay, I did not sign up for if, this. You're right. If all you do is play Civilization V, you will die. Um, <laughs> but the... Uh, and, and that's not because Civilization V is wonderful. It's because it's too good. It's the, it's the pleasure button kind of thing. But uh, the... Crazy. Fair. The, uh, <laughs> the point that I have about it is that, like, you know, if, if you don't, if you haven't stored their email and their location and their, like, real name. And demographic data. And demographic data. <laughs> Jesus. Why? <laughs> and then stop selling information to ad companies, guys. Um, if all you have is how they play the game, I feel like it's actually relatively hard to get harmful information about sure. somebody. And, like, I could, I could maybe see that you could, like, maybe identify certain disabilities or other things that people probably don't want out there all the time um, easily. Or, like, you could maybe, like, you could maybe see, like, well, they, they, this, this person is, is a man and they sure are picking shirtless boy characters a lot. Like, that, you could potentially leak, like, harmful information that way. This but, talk is taking a totally different tone than I thought it would. <laughs> That's probably my bad. Um, but, yeah, I, I, like, I, in general, I, it's very hard for me to think of circumstances. If you don't play as Boudicca in Civ Five. you clearly don't care about your interactive experience. I don't even disagree. Well, and there you go. You agree on something. Hey. You agree on lots of things halfway. Sometimes. So are there any things that you ever don't agree on? Like, do you ever have conflicting goals and issues you have to work through? I want my robots to be fun and dumb. Yeah, and I want them to be, like... like Smart. So smart. I, I know. Want, yeah, I want them to be able to, I want to, them like, to be stupid. I, I just... I feel like, like, what I want is, like, Skyrim, but all of the AI is so smart that you can, like, literally do everything in a game, right? Where you can, like, step into a game and, like, chop down a tree, and the person who has land rights over that tree comes over to you and, like, you chopped down my tree, and you're like, yeah, but it's such a tree, and they're like, that's reasonable, and they leave you alone. Like, <laughs> that's... That's what I want. But, like, it's not that. It's, like, it's most of the games that we have now are, like, completely nuanceless. Like, if you if you don't, if you, like, smack them in the head and then walk away and come back, they're like, hello, 
And they should be like, you just hit me in the head a month ago. Like, I remember you. You walked up to me and for no reason at all brutalized me in public. I do appreciate that CK3, and you, see, you also hate the numbers game of this, yeah. is that CK3, for instance, will be like, mine is 80, they won't accept a deal, and then you hover over it, and it's like, why they don't like you. Yeah. And it's great for me, because in CK3, you have to keep track of, like, hundreds of people, and so you'll be like, why doesn't this guy want to get in an alliance with me? And they're like, you killed my dad! And I'm like, <laughs> did I? That did happen. That is, like, sounds like something ago. I would have done. But it's not in the forefront of my brain in terms of that happened 13 years ago in game, and I just, it's just not on the top of my list of problems right now. And it's reasonable that he's upset that I killed his dad, and it's nice to see all the reasons that uh, he doesn't like me. Um. <laughs> and like that, I get, I, like from a, from a mechanical gameplay perspective, where like you are a strategy game person, sure. and your goal is to play the game like a game. It's chess, but better. And, like, that is a good experience to, to deliver, and I get it. But for me, I would want that information to come from, like, your, like, advisor who comes in. And, like, your advisor has alter, alter, ulterior motives. So, like, are they telling you that this person right, doesn't like you? Like, is... Yeah. Yeah. Like, I want them to feel like people, and I want to have that experience. I Maybe I'm just lonely, I don't know. Far too late into the game that you had to befriend your spy master. I took a lot of people getting murdered, and I'm like, but my spy master is so good, I don't- Oh, he hates me. Okay. And it turns out that if your spy master hates you, he can be bribed to kill you. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's so like, the numbers game doesn't need to break immersion, <laughs> but I feel like it does, usually. I mean- It reminds you that you're playing a video game. Not that, not that you can't get past that. And I think that Crusader Kings especially does a good balance of the two. Sure. We're like, yeah, there's actually some hidden information here. Like, you don't actually know that it was your son that killed you until you're playing your son. And your son's like, yeah, I killed that guy. Um, and like that's cool. That's interesting. Stuff like that happen. Yeah, I'm not saying that you can't do it, but it my in my ideal game universe, all of that stuff is implicitly beautifully communicated through the mechanism of something that's that's not my job, it's your job to communicate that without numbers. And then everybody <laughs> loves it and it's fun, and also it feels completely authentic and not gay sure. at all. That is what I would like. But I realize that that's not like practical, it's just what I want. I'm also a dork who loves numbers. Like, that's just inherently... My favorite kind of game is just a spreadsheet, but we put, like, really pretty graphics on it. Not even really pretty graphics. Like, it can be really simplistic. I love um, Prison Architect, for instance. It's just a big old spreadsheet. And I'm like, thank God. Finally, somebody's realized that all I want is just a spreadsheet. And then there's, like, a little bit of a game scattered on top of it. That's all I need in my life. You and I are very different gamers. I... Don't deny that I'm not a dork. I just that's what I love in my life. Sudoku, best best game released so far. <laughs> Good game. It, and listen, Good Sudoku's game. great. Steve, talk a little about the things that you do want in your idea world and how you would like, you know, the pinnacles of AI design. But what are some of the more common shortcomings or pitfalls that like people just getting into AI design or engineering might fall into, like new trappy type stuff? Gang up on the leader. That Gang is up on the leader is the biggest one of the Oh, I see you're winning, and we all acknowledge that you're winning. Time for you to not be winning anymore, because it's become a 1v10 situation. Um, it is important to have some AI aware of like the balance of the game. It is important to have certain systems in place so that the AI can be notified, hey, this person's winning a little bit. But also, the gang up on the leader stuff makes you feel really upset. It almost punishes you for winning. It is, like... If the second you got into first place and got too far ahead in Mario Kart, every Eternal single other person, well, every single other person got a blue shell, and you're just like, but I did, I just went so, I just did so good, and then the AI threw ten different blue shells at me, and that's really upsetting. Um, I understand why it exists. It's basically the oh god, this person's gonna win. Let's make them fight for it. And I don't necessarily have a massive issue with that concept. Um, it just feels really upsetting when you're suddenly having to go and fight off every other player in the game. Yeah, that's that's a good example. I think that rampant cheating is is probably the other big one. Like it's actually pretty obvious when your AIs are cheating, usually. And I think I, I think the like the sort of critical mistakes are things that are very easy to correct if you plan for them ahead of time, but very hard to fix once you get a lot of inertia behind your system. Like at the end of the day, you know, the, the AI systems for games that are as complicated as ours end up being huge. And so you need to know what your principles are going in. And I think that one of the commonly common pitfalls, maybe not even newbie, but frequent pitfalls, is just 
oh, it's AI, I'm going to use, you know, a state-space search algorithm or whatever. And if you plan on doing that and you build your, you bank everything on being able to come up with like a good heuristic function, whatever good means, and then you find yourself six months down the line with like a handful of numbers that you can sort of tune, you, you find yourself in a situation where like balance is impossible because you just don't have enough control over what you're trying to do. Or you can't actually make your AI consistently do something for a long period of time because the system is just completely against that. It acts in the moment and it, it, you can't really change it to do anything other than that by the time that you've shipped. Um, so I, I think that the, uh, what I would say is that relying on sort of traditional AI techniques, especially in a, in a domain like ours, is tough. But also relying on just like pure code to do it too, where you have code that runs, that evaluates the entire game and makes decisions momentarily is also bad because it's entirely opaque. You can't, there's no way for you to data drive that. There's no way for you to mod it. There's no way for you to tweak it once it goes. So I would say designing your AI for data driving and modability is a good way to avoid a lot of those sorts of issues. And if you think about that, when you get started, there's lots of you that puts you in a mindset where you're like, okay, how do I make sure that anybody can get to this? Not just me or my engineering team or my designers, but players. If players can understand it and access it, then it's good controllable content. And that's, I think, especially for AI design, especially for delicate AI design, really important. But that also then factor into maintenance of your system over time, like post-launch towards beta, all that kind of stuff. You're like, just you need to make some changes. Yeah, data driving is, a, it's not a silver bullet for it because there, you, you then have to deal with the additional complexity of like, okay, well, how much control can we actually expose in data in a way that's not mind scramblingly complicated? And how do you, how do you, what sorts of compromises do you need to make on the like raw potency of your system such that you can load it with new data every time? But yeah, I mean, I, usually I think the, the trade-off falls on the side of data driving. We're like, yeah, if you can just load new AI behaviors, that's awesome. Yeah. Um, and so I think usually that's a good way to make maintenance easier. Although I will say, since AI impacts so much of the game, and I will use an anecdote from our project, I'm going to have to unfortunately skimp on the specifics. I apologize. Mm -hmm. um, I remember pushing some, uh, a large amount of data to the game regarding teaching the AI how to do a bunch of new things, and I, the actual data was good. It worked locally, which I know works on my machine, doesn't mean anything, <laughs> but it broke our build for so long because, because of that, the game, because the AI just got better at playing the game, there was a bunch of new code paths that were just now suddenly being gotten to in the specific way of, I'm really good at playing the game now. Um, that nobody really accounted for. And so it has, you know, wide scale effects. Moreover, if somebody tweaks a system in the game um, from a code standpoint or from a design standpoint, the AI has to then change to account for it. There's a lot of growing pains and a lot of moving pains when it comes to AI yep. to adapt to new ideas, to um, deal with the fact that sometimes we break things. Yeah. Um, and it's all encompassing, which is, it's difficult. That's a huge roadblock. Yeah, I mean, and, and that is it, the quality of the thing that you want at the end of the day is, is there's, there's a, a concept in math and engineering and everything. It's conservation of difficulty, right? Like, sure. if, you, if you want to make a thing that's better, it's now harder to do. That's just how it is, unfortunately. And so, like, yeah, you know, if you want to, like, maintenance of your system, there's a, if, as soon as you introduce something complicated to take over some job, that job being, like, if you data drive your system, the job that you've taken over is calling an engineer to come in and redo all of the C++ involved with this. Now you can do it with some other thing. And that's great. But it's complicated because you have to validate it. You have to test it. You have to come up with all sorts of ways. You have to make sure that adding new stuff to that system isn't overly cumbersome. That's complicated. And so, like, yeah, absolutely. Like, maintenance is important and I don't think you can actually just fix it. It's like an iterative refinement process of like, okay, we introduced this new, uh, like very complicated, like scripting language or whatever, and now you can script stuff and that's great, but uh, there's a thousand compiler errors in our scripting thing and it is possible to like full hard crash the game in ways that you never think of. And you're gonna, I think, probably be encountering those issues long after launch. Um, sure. So there's no 
perfect way to do it, unfortunately. If there were, everybody would be doing it, I imagine. But, I mean, a, a visual scripting system like something like Unreal has is mm -hmm. a pretty good idea. Like, very sandbox, but enough flexibility to give you interesting stuff, expose that to modders. It could work, but that took them years to develop, and, like, they're, they're epic games. They have a lot of really good engineers, and it was hard for them. So, certainly there are trade-offs when you go to try to make long-term maintainability a goal, um, and they don't always pay off. But I think usually introducing systems that make it easier to modify stuff down the road is a good idea. Especially if they're simple, but they frequently are. So something else that frequently comes up during development is how do you test the AI for something like a strategy game AI? Like, what how do you look for? If I'm a tester in QA, how would I say, like, hi, I've been given this to, like, test now. What am I looking for? Would you Where's the <laughs> test plan? How do I write this? Yeah, it's difficult, isn't it? Um, I mean, obviously the most immediate stuff you look for is code getting to do paths. The AI um, crashing in an area that has a comment of this should be theoretically impossible is never good, but it's all... I that's love this comment. Time. This should never happen. <laughs> <laughs> uh, um, that being said, I mean, that's kind of an issue with AI, is that it's pretty subjective. Um, there are certain um, tools that uh, Brian, our like, resident god of AI stuff, uh, has made to be able to go and very quickly test of, okay... What are their priorities? I can just see them in a little like debug menu, for instance. Um, but that doesn't necessarily make it perfect. And moreover, it's difficult to account for every single case. You know, strategy games are huge. Yeah. So it's like, well, in this one game, this one time, this guy made this one decision that I didn't agree with. And then it's the, I don't, I don't know how I'm supposed to fix that. Um, or moreover, it's also difficult to identify those large structural issues. If you do not have 200, 300, 400 iterations of it, you know, one of the things that Brian does a lot when he's testing out changes is he will, you know, run our game X number of times, like hundreds of times, and just see if he can establish data over time, because that's at least what we do here. In terms of uh, what they do in other studios, I'm not entirely certain. I know that... Um, reading the CK3 dev blogs are always incredibly interesting about not only here's what we're trying to do, but why. Um, I, their most recent AI update was making things like friends and enemies a little bit more impactful, um, with the idea being that the AI feels a little more alive in that way, because you have a friend who's really looking out for you versus a rival who wants to see you uh, dead or discouraged incredibly. Um, but that being said, a lot of the stuff is just trying to identify an attention and then going after the, to the best of your abilities. And yeah, yeah. I mean, like the, the when we were talking about exhausting all the memory of every computer on the planet, like we were not kidding. Like there, there's you can't come up with a matrix that contains every possible state of interest and ensure that that happens. What you can do, especially if your AI are very capable, is put them into an online match together with 40 of them, all initialized with different parameters, and run that continuously as part of your CI. And just keep doing that all the time. You'll find a lot of crashes, and then you can collect statistical data over time and be like, hey, um, no one has ever built this unit in the history of time. Is the code path broken, or is it too hard to get? Those are sorts of things that you can start to, to analyze, but you'll notice very quickly that you're testing both the game and your AI at the same time. So who's testing who? How are you getting things done? And I think the end of the day reality of it is like your AI is good if it's fun to play against. Your AI is good if it meets player expectation. How do you figure out what that is? Get 10,000 people in front of it. Keep on feeding QA testers to it until you, until Don't every everyone is happy. Um, and so... Our QA already has to right. go I, so I should much. not use any negative terminology around QA people. They're jumping up as it is. But I, I think I that... QA. I would die for them. So why? But usually they're like the first abused and longest abused at companies, unfortunately. But I think, yeah, I, I think the only actual way to do it is just playtest a lot. A lot. And that is just, there's no easy answer. It's a complicated problem. The metric that you want to maximize is how much people like playing against it. You have to get people to play against it. And you have to get a lot of people to play against it for a long time. That's expensive. But I think that's probably the only way to actually do it. I think we only have time for maybe one last question from me. Yeah, you all inspired a lot of conversation. Thank you very much. Uh, sure. <laughs> we've had a lot of questions and comments in the chat, both on Twitch and oh. YouTube. Uh, okay. Got into the QA bit quite a bit. 
Um, so why don't we go with that last conversation? How sure. do you actually train QA to effectively give you feedback on AI? Uh, my argument is you don't, probably. I mean, I would also say that we're blessed with a lot of the people who are in QA here at Oxide are just fantastically talented individuals. Yeah, you gotta be really um, thorough. And that's just sort of a blessing that we've had, you know, is that a lot of people, um, and moreover, they're not afraid to reach out with the, hey, I've noticed this trend. Mm -hmm. Right? So even if it's just the, I don't have a specific bug, it's the, I've noticed this trend. Mm -hmm. It is incredibly important uh, for me as a designer to listen to the things that QA notice. They are in the game more than anybody else. Yeah, that's right. True. And so when they identify a behavior, they identify something that's not feeling right. Mm -hmm. I find it exceptionally important to listen to them because most of the time they're <laughs> right. Yeah. Um, yeah. And that's I, that's like that's but that's the that's the human element that like only like an actual QA engineer can give you, which is like, hey, I played this game a lot, and this seems odd. Like sure. that's that's like this sort of intangible qualitative data that's so hard to get, and it's awesome when you can get it. But I would say that if you want to validate an entire AI system, you're never going to get enough of it, especially from like like our QA engineers are talented, like high paid individuals that need, you know, a lot of funding and, and training and time to get as good as they are. And they're amazing, but they can't do everything. They can't be anywhere. And I think it falls on the development team, the people that design the AI to build testing in mind, like how I need to be able to set up the AI in a particular state and verify that 10 turns later, it does what I expected it to do. And so I think that testing of your AI system, unit testing of the code itself, and then coming up with like data-driven scenarios where you can pit AI against each other in specific ways, look for known good outcomes. Like that's what I do when I'm developing. Sure. Is I will make an AI feature. I will put in a particular uh, log point that says, "Hey, I got here. I'll put the game in a state and I'll run it for ten turns. And if that's happened, then good. And if it hasn't, then I did something wrong." And so a lot of this stuff, like the systems, people that understand the guts of the systems, understand the statistics of what should be happening and when, need to take the responsibility for testing in a system like this, in my view. You can't just throw it at QA and expect them to understand everything that you want to do because it's complicated for the engineers that sat down to develop it. And you can't communicate that without a lot of dedicated time. The people that are testing it won't know all of the thoughts that you had when you were making it, so they won't know where pain points could be. Yeah. But to Emily's point, at the end of the day, it kind of doesn't matter to some extent because if it doesn't feel right, if it doesn't exactly. feel fun against, that's the actual bug. You need and, both. And it's like, yeah, I've seen this at other companies where then like the developer will just dismiss the QA person. I'm like, well, it's doing what I want. It did the thing. It hit the test, so it's correct. But but that's not the point. Yeah, right. I would say I would say you need you absolutely need both. And, but my my stance will always be that you need engineers that care a lot about stability and quality of the system. Not disagree to begin with. with that statement. And then you need a lot of QA personnel that understand how to make a good video game and how to communicate when it's bad. And then you need players to test it. It's just, it's, it's, how do you make a good game? Like, Everything. It's, it's the same question of how do you make a good game? It's so <laughs> fundamental. All right. Well, we don't we have also got a question comment from Emily Horton on YouTube. Yes. Hi, Emily. Emily. Who's that? Hi, Emily. <laughs> that it sounded like you were saying to leave the creative uh, system, systemic exploits to the human players instead of the AI. But maybe we should just yes. have one last look at cheating since we were going to that a whole bunch on the on the conversation. <laughs> uh, do you ever have the AI cheat to lose since it is actually not that difficult to make undefeatable AI? It's I've a little bit. I have I like cheat to lose. Yeah, I love making my idiot robot kids make the wrong decision. Yeah, I love it. It's living vicariously through them since I don't take those kind of risks in real life. Wow, is that you know. They're not like gets a tattoo late at night. Yeah, exactly. Like, you idiot. I want all of my CK3 bit babies are complete idiots, and I would die for every single one of them. Um, but yeah, I think that it, it is kind of fantastic to have AI cheat to lose, for instance. Um, that happens a lot at the very, very, very lowest level of a lot of these games is that the AI is basically trying their best to drown themselves so that you can magically win. Um, <laughs> it's it's yeah. an important process. I think that that's probably a good summary of how most omniscient AI play the game. They are cheating to lose. They're cheating to, like, let you see what they're doing. They're like, oh, no, my army walked through your vision. 
like that is exactly cheating to lose. <laughs> it, <laughs> it happens all the time. And I think that yeah, that, that's more or less like if you if you want absolute control over game experience, you have to be cheating to lose because otherwise you can't cheat to win. You I'll can't print out t-shirts that say that now for the entire company. Cheat to lose. Cheat, cheat to, to lose. lose. Yeah, I, I think the, that's probably what you want. Now you, I'm thinking of the control. Mario Party video where it's just Louise G wins by doing nothing. <laughs> And all the other AI like eventually go on try to uh, lose at the game because they're at the easiest difficulty. Yeah. Absolutely delightful. Yeah, you you want you want to, if you want to play God like as your AI and have it create certain circumstances for the player, they need to be able to play badly. So yeah, I would say absolutely all the time. Yeah, in the end, we <laughs> want satisfying AI, not genius AI. All right, last question right. from Leaf Meyer. Are there I any leave. games that you all think had a good procedural system to generate a narrative? So let's do this one quickly and out. Procedural system to generate a narrative. You know my opinion on this, Leaf. It's it's Rimworld and it's Dwarf Fortress or it's nothing. I, I think that I think that like actually maybe Wildermyth. There people have started well, to do oh, this Wildermyth lately. Is good too. But usually, usually generative AI is very mad libby, and it is it is my life's passion, my white whale, to make it good. I don't know that it's ever been done. It maybe has been, and I just don't know. I was gonna say some good ones, and I think to some degree, mad lib is correct way to refer to it. That doesn't mean that it's not kind of fun to have some silly. It's still fun. It's yeah. just not like a. It's not like you sat down with a DM and had like an enthralling, amazing experience. Okay. Like with, with the large language model sort of uh, generative AI stuff that's just coming out. These like multi million dollar language models. Even they make sort of hacky stories if you ask them sure. to. So I feel like like that is like a fundamentally hard problem to actually do. And I think while we are approaching a point in like technological computing where we can do it. I, I don't know that it's been done to the level that I would consider to be, like, really awesome. Although Dwarf Fortress is maybe the best attempt that I've ever seen, and it's, like, 40 years old. So, Okay, Lee, that was quick in answers. I thought it would be. All right, thank you very much to everyone from Oxide on this great conversation in chat. Uh, if you're a GGA member, you can join them in Discord. We'll share that with info with GGA members. And once more, a big round of applause, everyone, for the entire team at Oxide. Thank you very much. Thanks, Andrew. Thanks, Thanks for guys. having us.